Fallout Season 1 has just released on Prime, and the first season of Jonathan Nolan's new show is set up to be a wildly dark and comedic adaptation of the popular video game series. In my opinion, it was an excellent first season for the show, and while it had a satisfying ending for the story of this season, it also gives us a big tease surrounding what's to come beyond Season 1. So in this explained analysis, I'm going to be giving you my breakdown of Fallout on Prime, discussing what it means for the plot as we move towards a potential season 2. There will be spoilers in this video, so if you haven't watched the entirety of season 1, then I would recommend checking it out before watching my breakdown. Before I get into it though, if you want to see more videos on Fallout and other upcoming TV releases, then don't forget to support this upload by giving it a like rating and subscribing to the channel. But without further ado, let's dive into my explained video for Fallout Season 1. So the realm of Fallout is full of brutality, creatures and despair, and in this unforgiving landscape, the key to existence lies in one's ability to survive. The new Prime Video series, inspired by the famous video game franchise, immerses viewers in a world of bloodshed and twisted comedy. And although the first season doesn't directly adapt the central narratives of the games, they cleverly incorporate certain elements, and they also leave us eagerly anticipating a familiar setting in a second season. When it comes to season 1 though, the show opens in a familiar way to those games. In 2077, we witness a nuclear catastrophe catastrophe that transforms Earth into a radioactive wasteland, and we learn that survivors seek refuge in vault vaults underground. The world of Fallout is a retro future where microprocessors were never developed, a key aspect that drives the 1950s aesthetic despite the advanced technology. As humanity faces another cold war, massive Fallout bunkers known as vaults become the only hope for survival. Most of the population don't have the money nor power to reserve a spot in these vaults, and right from the outset, we watch the destruction of the world through the eyes of Walter Goggins' Cooper Howard and his daughter Janie Howard during a birthday party in the hills. Following this, it's been over two centuries since that devastating nuclear war decimated civilization, leaving behind a desolate wasteland inhabited by flesh-eating ghouls, cunning thieves, and mutated creatures. And in this world, one filled with radiation, treachery, and a unique currency in the form of bottle caps, it offers a small glimmer of hope for a brighter future. That hope comes through the introduction of the vaults, and the show introduces us to Vault 33 overseer Hank McLean and his daughter Lucy. Life within the vault is centred around a simple yet crucial task, breeding to ensure the survival and growth of the population. Those fortunate enough to secure a spot in Vault Tech's vaults experience a lifestyle reminiscent of the 1950s, patiently awaiting the day they can return to the surface. Now, fans of the games will be aware that each vault established by vault Tech served not only as a refuge from nuclear devastation, but also as a testing ground for various experiments on its inhabitants. Initially, it's hinted that Hank McLean's Vault 33 was designed to simulate a flawless society. However, as the season progresses, the concept of peace and its definition is shattered when it becomes clear that it's dictated by a select few within the corporation. But before we get to those shocking turn of events, we learn a bit more about how the vaults we focus on operate. Vault 33, an experimental vault, is intricately connected to two other vaults, Vault 32 and Vault 31, forming a tripartite society that thrives on trade and intermarriage. Vault 32 and 33 were designed as sister vaults to 31, with the specific purpose of preserving the management elite of the Vault Tech Corporation. The vision behind Vaults 32 and 33 was to create breeding pools for individuals with exceptional genetics, ensuring that their descendants would possess robust physical health and become the future supermanagers of the vault. To maintain the integrity of their bloodlines, interbreeding was strongly discouraged as it could lead to undesirable abnormalities. 
Throughout its 200 year existence, Vault 33 had been fortunate enough to avoid significant hardships. However, it did face a temporary setback in the form of a brief famine, which resulted in a number of casualties. Despite this, the Vault did persevere, continuing to thrive and uphold its societal structure. But the show of combined strength and peace that Vault 33 depicts among its residents during the first episode is something that is also squashed early on too. After Lucy was married to an unknown man from Vault 32, individuals from that vault start to raid and attack those from 33 soon after the wedding takes place. A band of connected raiders manage to sneak into Vault 32 by utilising Rose McLean's pit boy, the supposedly deceased mother of Lucy. They pretended to be the overseer and residents of that vault, who had passed away two years prior, and they intended to infiltrate Vault 33 and abduct its overseer, Hank. As we learn later in the season, the leader of the raiders, Lee Moldaver, requires a code from a vault tech executive to activate the power system of her observatory. But we'll come to all those revelations in more detail towards the conclusion. So following this attack, Ella Purnell's vault dweller Lucy decides to venture out of her safe community and try to find her dad. She discovers a world ravaged by mutations caused by heavy radiation, and some of the humans have transformed into zombie-like creatures known as ghouls, making survival a constant struggle. As the characters navigate the treacherous LA wasteland and the underground vaults, they search for answers, power, and their loved ones. The coveted item that everyone seeks is Siggy Wilzig's severed head, containing a valuable asset that could potentially solve all of their problems. Lucy is determined to retrieve the head to rescue her father from Moldova, setting the stage for an intense and thrilling set of events. She ends up losing the head to a radiated sea creature in the midst of a tense encounter with Walter Goggins' ghoul. Captured by him, he uses her as a swap for a large supply of chems. While Lucy lost the head that Wilzig begged her to sever, we learn that she struggles to deal with life on the surface compared to what she was taught down below. The ghoul tries to tell her that she will change in this world and ultimately become a killer. And when she escapes the hold of those who the ghoul gave her to, and a quite comedic organ harvesting robot named Codsworth, we see that she might be on a path to become a fellow killer. But it's not just Lucy who gets a lot of development when it comes to adjusting or living in this violent world though, because Fallout focuses on a bunch of central characters. There's the ghoul who ends up following Wilzig's head for reasons not fully understood to begin with. However, as the story unfolds, we realise it's all connected to his past as a renowned cowboy actor in the pre-apocalyptic world, shooting commercials for vault and finding out dark secrets about their operation. Then there's Maximus, aspiring for a knighthood from the strict Brotherhood of Steel, but beginning to doubt his chosen path. And let's also not forget Lucy's brother Norm, who uncovers unsettling truths about the vaults and suspects their father's involvement. So starting with the ghoul, fans of the Fallout games are well aware that ghouls were once humans, transformed by the devastating effects of a radioactive nuclear fallout. These resilient beings have an extended lifespan compared to regular humans due to a process called ghoulification. Interestingly, ghouls can still consume regular food and drink, but they also have the unique ability to tolerate and digest irradiated food. Additionally, their bodies metabolise drugs at an accelerated rate, allowing them to handle higher doses. In the TV show, we witness the ghoul indulging in various narcotics, including Jet, an inhalable drug within the game's universe. Unfortunately, ghouls also face discrimination and are often unwelcome in settlements throughout the world. The TV series depicts this when Lucy and the ghoul cross paths in a nearby town, and it also touches upon the concept of ghouls going feral, where they lose their sanity and resemble zombies. It's generally believed to to be a matter of time before this transformation occurs and they have to take drugs in order to slow that process down. Cooper Howard has undergone this type of transformation as seen in the show's opening scene where he flees on horseback with his daughter amidst falling bombs. Despite being the oldest ghoul around, he has somehow managed to avoid becoming feral for longer than others. In later episodes, the ghoul faces near death after missing his drug dose, showcasing his high tolerance. And throughout the series, it becomes clear that the ghoul is not only one of the few 
individuals who remembers life before the apocalypse, but also has a deep understanding of vault tech itself. His wife Barb, who held a prominent position within the company, used her influence to feature Cooper in their advertisements. However, as time went on and Cooper became more involved with vault tech, he started to question their true intentions. When Barb expressed her desire for their family to be placed in one of the good vaults, Cooper became suspicious and took matters into his own hands. Encouraged by Moldaver, he used a listening device to uncover the extent of Barb's involvement with vault tech. Shockingly, Cooper discovered that not only was his wife complicit in the company's sinister actions, but that she also supported vault tech's plan to drop the bombs themselves, ensuring that the vaults would never go unused. And again, I'll come on to more of these reveals towards the end. Moving on, another crucial character is Aaron Moton's Maximus. He starts off as a conflicted member of the Brotherhood of Steel, but eventually becomes one of Lucy's few allies in the Wasteland. His captain, Roger Maxon, founded the Brotherhood of Steel after the Great War, aiming to safeguard and control advanced technology. The Brotherhood remains wary of humanity, believing that people cannot be trusted with technology that could lead to the downfall of society. This faction, with its mix of religious, technocratic and militaristic elements has noble intentions but questionable methods. Many members of the Brotherhood are portrayed as authoritative figures relying on intimidation tactics to enforce their sense of justice and showcase the impressive capabilities of their power armour. This is evident in the early episodes of Fallout where Maximus as a child was rescued by a Brotherhood knight during a nuclear disaster at Shady Sands only 50 years ago. Now as an adult, he aspires to don the power armor to experience that invincibility. However, the higher ranking members of the Brotherhood manipulate and oppress their own soldiers. In the opening episode, viewers are introduced to Maximus and the rest of the initiates as they take on grueling tasks and rigorous training. These trainees are taught to prioritize the values of the Brotherhood above all else. For squires such as Maximus, the ultimate goal is to rise to the rank of knight and don the iconic armor. And each model of the power armor offers unique capabilities, including the version featured in the Fallout series, which maintains a distinctive metallic look. Not only does the Brotherhood of Steel's armor exude an intimidating presence, but it also enhances the wearer's strength, resilience, and agility. And in the unforgiving wasteland, the power armor proves to be a game changer for warriors like Maximus. As a newly appointed squire, Maximus convinces his captain to make him a squire to the mighty knight Titus, who dons the impressive armor. Initially, Maximus is entrusted with the responsibility of maintaining this awe-inspiring suit, which only adds to its enigmatic presence. However, when Titus meets his unfortunate demise in the second episode, Maximus seizes the opportunity to step into the armor himself. Now, there are questions over Maximus betraying his friends to become the squire of Titus early on. And while it does appear that way to begin with, we later learn that it was his friends doing to help Maximus ascend because they knew that he wanted that opportunity the most. Coming to the final character and narrative elements that lead us into Season 1's conclusion, these revolve around the findings of Lucy's brother Norm when it comes to Vault 31 and 32. We learn through the scenes with Norm that Vault 32 was a result of the disastrous consequences of a famine. Initially, it's assumed that the Raiders leader, Lee Moldaver, wrecked havoc within the vault. However, as the season progresses, Norm and fellow Vaulter Chet uncover the truth that the vault had already succumbed to ruin long before its doors were opened to the outside world. Inside, they stumble upon the haunting sight of partially devoured corpses, alongside numerous instances of apparent suicides as the desperate members sought any means possible to alleviate their hunger. Also, they learn that Vault 33 has a unique method of selecting new overseers. Norm finds out that all the overseers have been select individuals from Vault 31, and this leads him to believe that this vault is in charge of the whole structure. And while he is right about that, he's not prepared for how far that conspiracy goes and what Vault 31 actually contains. It turns out that all the overseers weren't from 31, but rather that that vault was storing the bodies of every past and future overseer using cryogenic freezing. Unveiling Vault Tech's sinister plot, it was Vault 31 that held the key as the overseers froze themselves before unleashing the apocalypse, not once but twice. 
However, one exception was made for vault Tech member Bud Askins, who transferred his brain into a small robot companion. This allowed him to live indefinitely and revive his fellow overseers whenever the need arose. The second time they unleashed the apocalypse was actually the disaster that took place in Maximus's home, Shady Sands, as this location stood as a potential beacon of hope for humanity's return to normality. vault Tech wanted dominance when it came to returning to the surface and didn't like that Shady Sands stood as a revived example of the world before, with its residents having freedom. So that's why this location was nuked only 50 years ago. And this links into some of the things we discover about Vault 4 later in the series, the vault that Lucy and Maximus fall trapped to underground when looking for medical supplies in a Shady Sands hospital. We discover that the scientists there once called Shady Sands their home. Following years of horrific experiments, the mutants created there by the scientists rebelled and took control of Vault 4, which eventually opened its doors to the wasteland and welcomed survivors from Shady Sands. While they're overseer may harbour some hate against those living on the surface, Vault 4 becomes the place where Lucy confronts and learns to overcome her perception of those above. The one question left to answer leading into the ending was the purpose of Siggy Wilzig's head and why Lucy needed to transport it to Moldava. Years prior to sparking the Great War of 2077, vault Tech had already begun acquiring any technology that posed a threat to its grand plans for global domination. This included purchasing Lee Moldava's company just as she was on the brink of completing a groundbreaking invention with the potential to change the course of history. The lost hidden technology technology that Wilzig implanted in his own neck was a crucial artifact that he ultimately sacrificed himself to ensure Lucy could deliver it to Moldava. And because Moldava was alive in 2077 and still is 200 years later, we presume that she went into cryo so that she was able to fight with the resistance all these years later. In the season 1 finale, we discovered that Wilzig had stolen this technology for Cold Fusion, a game-changing advancement. Lucy is able to get Wilzig's head back from a Brotherhood Squire with the help of a stalling Maximus and then she heads straight to Moldava for these very answers. So in the final episode of Fallout Season 1, tension fills the air as Lucy hands over the head and Moldova proceeds to reveal the truth behind her father's kidnapping. The question of who initiated the devastating nuclear bombs that triggered the Great War is now answered. It wasn't China and the culprit behind this catastrophic event is none other than Vault Tech itself. As the ending unravels, it becomes clear that Vault Tech was not just a regular business entity. Instead, it transformed into a sinister death cult driven by capitalism. The executives of vault Tech, which included Hank, believed that time itself could be their ultimate weapon against their enemies, so they decided to unleash nuclear destruction upon the world while securing their own survival through long-term stasis. And the fallout from their actions left a lasting impact on the wasteland and its inhabitants. As explained before, vault Tech executives would often awaken as necessary to oversee their underground communities. When North Norm finds out about the cryo chambers and the purpose of Vault 31, he is left with no choice but to wait for rescue, and we can only speculate that he might have resorted to cryo sleep there too. And of course, the inhabitants of the bunkers remained oblivious to all of these events. vault Tech's ultimate plan is to eventually return to the surface and establish a civilization in their control. This is why they bombed Shady Sands, serving as the capital city of the new California Republic. vault Tech refuses to allow humanity to thrive on its own terms, but thanks to Wilzig's head and the artifact buried within, this monstrous corporation may not be able to thwart humanity's efforts to survive. Moldava's breakthrough in unlocking cold fusion energy has unleashed a powerful force into the world, as she was finally able to unlock free unlimited energy, as seen by the lights of the once darkened region of Los Angeles, flickering back to life. Cold fusion has the potential to put an end to the disputes and pave the way for a peaceful future, once where mankind could thrive without the influence of vault Tech. This was precisely why they acquired and concealed the technology in the first place. 
However, by the end of the finale, the Brotherhood of Steel has seized control of it by taking over the observatory. With unlimited power at their disposal, it makes us question what they will do with it next. As Moldava warns Maximus, he may be the only hope to prevent the militaristic Brotherhood, who distrust humanity as much as vault from exploiting this incredible power. The technology has the potential to bring an end to war forever, but before that can happen, there are still battles to be fought, including against those who were responsible for the world's destruction in the first place. Lucy's father, being one of these individuals, shows his true nature and intentions come the showdown at the end. Hank's betrayal even extended to his own wife, who fled to Shady Sands with her children after discovering the horrifying truth about him. But she was eventually turned to a ghoul after the devastating bomb drop 50 years ago. She was also present at the end in the observatory, and Lucy eventually shoots her in an act that appears to be out of mercy. But in the final moments of the season, after all about Hank was revealed, the ghoul arrives at this standoff, and with him being the original poster boy of vault and understanding the manipulations that took place after listening in on his own wife's plan for it too, we learn that he also has a deep understanding of Hank McLean's sinister nature. Hank steals the Brotherhood power armour, and after being shot in the cheek by the ghoul, who has a precise shot, we learn that he didn't intend to kill him. Instead, the ghoul implanted a tracker in Hank's face to trace his next move. There is, of course, someone on the surface overseeing vault actions, coordinating between vaults, launching devastating attacks on cities, and ensuring their secrets remain hidden. And the ghoul anticipates that Hank will lead them straight to this mysterious figure, the puppet master behind the world's chaos. So as the ghoul, the dog, and Lucy venture into Hollywood at the very end, sponsored by Nuka-Cola, the pieces of the puzzle are beginning to fit together. And in the very final shot of the season, we learn exactly where Hank is headed in that power armour. It turns out that it's a famous location from the Fallout game series that many players will be well aware of. As the camera pans, we witness Hank's arrival at the iconic skyline of New Vegas. This introduction of New Vegas hints at the possibility of encountering beloved characters and familiar locations in Season 2. Fallout New Vegas, a highly acclaimed instalment in the video game franchise transports players to a twisted version of Las Vegas within Fallout's post-apocalyptic world. Interestingly, this game is set 15 years prior to the events depicted in Prime Video's series, so we are left to wonder what lies ahead as we venture into this captivating realm. New Vegas revolved around the intense power struggle among three dominant factions competing for control over the region centred around New Vegas. The fate of Vegas ultimately rests in the hands of the Courier, the player-controlled protagonist. While the New California Republic is one of the groups vying for control, Fallout New Vegas offers four different endings, with the NCR emerging victorious in only one of them. And amidst this chaos, there is a mysterious figure from vault who manipulates events behind the scenes. So we'll have to wait and see who this turns out to be and what their plan is going forward. My current theory is that the ghoul or Cooper's wife Barb is the one pulling the strings, having come out of cryo and not being present with her husband or daughter during the series opening. But even if it isn't her, I still think that she'll have a big part to play down the line. We can only theorise, and after how good this season was, I think we will definitely get a season 2, which will give us all of those answers. While the Prime Video series based on Fallout has yet to receive an official renewal, the ending with Lucy and the Ghoul embarking on their journey to Sin City suggests that there's a lot more twists and turns to come once they arrive. But that was my breakdown and analysis for the first season of Fallout. Overall, this was a fantastic first season for Jonathan Nolan's new show, and just like the first season of Westworld, I think there's potential for a highly detailed and entertaining show that builds as the seasons go on. I do hope that Nolan can write and direct more in season 2, because his episodes here were truly great, and I think that's part of the reason why Westworld dropped in quality during its later seasons. He and other writers during season 1 and 2 had less of a role. So hopefully Fallout can retain this level of quality going forward and I'm really looking forward to seeing where they go with it all in season 2. But to those who have already seen the first season, what are your thoughts on all the events that went down and are you excited for a season 2? Let me know down below in the comment section. 
For more videos on Fallout and upcoming TV releases, then subscribe to the channel and turn on your notifications. Also, if you enjoyed this video, remember to leave a like rating and follow me on social media via the links in the description. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I've been Cortex, and as always, make some noise.